Hello, I'm Dr. Mark Mitchell, and I'm a professor of zoological medicine at Louisiana State University. Today, I'd like to talk about tortoises. The first thing I'd like to talk about is the enclosure to house our tortoise. And this is going to vary based on the size of the tortoise you acquire. If you're getting a juvenile tortoise, a smaller tank such as this will work just fine. But if you're getting an adult tortoise, depending on the species, you may actually need a fenced backyard to house them. So do your homework to make sure that you know how big that tortoise is going to get. When I'm using a glass tank, it's important to recognize because the animals can see through the glass, they'll sometimes try to walk through the glass and they may rub their nose and injure themselves. So pay close attention to that. If your tortoise seems to want to do that, just putting a barrier of some cardboard around the outside of it will prevent them from seeing through it and trying to do something like that. But I always recommend keeping the screen top on them, especially if we have pets such as dogs and cats, because they potentially can injure um, our tortoises. Once we've identified the enclosure we're going to use, we want to identify the most appropriate substrate. Because tortoises do like to burrow, it's important that the substrate be deep enough so that they can do and practice some of those natural behaviors. Now when I have a juvenile tortoise or I have a recent acquisition of an adult tortoise, I'll often tell the client to use some kind of a reptile liner or a newspaper so they can collect and monitor the feces. I always like to screen those because we do see parasites in these animals and we want to treat them before they become somewhat problematic. My preference for substrate, however, are things like the reptibark, as you can see in this enclosure. These wood-based substrates allow us to make it a little bit more of a dent. They're very aesthetically pleasing to me or you, the herpetoculturist, and it's more of a natural effect for the tortoise. They also help hold in some of the moisture, and so in certain climates that can help with keeping and controlling the humidity. We do have to be careful because if we're in a very dry environment, we can dry out the humidity. We'll talk later about why keeping up the humidity is important to help preventing things like dehydration. There are other substrates people recommend, such as pellets, food pellets, rabbit pellets. I'm not as crazy about those because they can get contaminated, and I worry about spores and different types of aerosolization of potential pathogenic organisms. So keep it as simple as possible. For those new acquisitions, use a reptile liner or paper and monitor those feces. And for an established setup, use something like a, an orchid bark or a reptile bark to ensure that you can provide that more natural type substrate. Once we have our substrate set, it's important that we get those accessories or that cage furniture in. The tortoises are a little bit different than some of the other animals we talk about, such as snakes and lizards, because they don't really need a whole lot of accessories. In most cases, what I like to provide these animals is just shelter. What our tortoises like to do is to go out and graze, and then they'll do that during the early morning. And then when the sun gets to its warmest point, they tend to stop grazing, and they'll go into a shelter to get out of the heat and then they'll go ahead and start grazing again in the afternoon. So for most of our tortoises, simply providing them some kind of a shelter within the enclosure that they can hide and having a shelter on both sides of the enclosure so that we can meet as we talk about the temperature gradient is really all that we need to do for these animals. In this particular case, I'll show you an example of putting these in here and quite simply making sure that the inlet is large enough for the animal to utilize and dark enough so that they can get away from anyone visualizing them. And we don't want things so high that they climb and fall off of them and can't rotate themselves because that could be potentially problematic. In addition to this though, we can go ahead and get certain plants that are non-toxic and for the aesthetic reasons, dress up the enclosure as well. Again, if you're going ahead and taking things out of your backyard, you want to make sure that they're going to be non-toxic because as a plant, the tortoise will want to eat them. We want to make sure that we have a food and a water bowl in the enclosure. We can use straight tap water. It doesn't need to be dechlorinated for tortoises. We'll use the chlorine again that's in the natural water to help keep down any pathogens. And I like that water just to be large enough that that tortoise can get in and soak. Make sure you change that water on a daily basis. Next, I'd like to talk about temperature and lighting. These are really important for our tortoises because our tortoises, like all reptiles, are ectotherms. 
That means that they regulate their body temperature based on environmental temperature. If we kept them at our air temperature in our houses, that would be too cool. And that could affect their metabolism, which then would affect their ability or desire to eat, their immune system, etc. And that can be really problematic. So it's important that you identify what the most appropriate temperature is for the tortoise that you have. For species like sulcata tortoises, I like to have a basking spot in the high 80s or low 90s. For red foot tortoises, probably closer to 86 to 88 degrees. You don't need to make the temperatures quite as warm as some suggest because that's getting these animals to grow a little bit faster than we want. And my goal is to keep them growing at a slower rate. They have a whole life to live and we don't want them to develop complications because of things like pyramiding and some of the consequences associated with that. No different than any of our other reptiles, there are three types of light that the sun provides that we want to make sure that we can provide for our tortoises in captivity. That includes ultraviolet light, visible light, and infrared light. The infrared light is what's associated with the temperature that I talked about, and we can use any of a variety of incandescent bulbs to do that. Most of the white type bulbs are the ones I'll use during the day. In the case of the sulcata we're going to set up here today, I'll make sure that I read the box, and based on the distance from the light to where the tortoise will be, I'll have an idea of what wattage I need to get that temperature of 88 to 90 degrees for my basking spot. I'll also use a thermometer and a hygrometer to help measure the temperature. There are very simple systems such as this, or as you can see in this enclosure, I have a digital system. That digital system, I can move around and get that temperature so that I can see that on my warm side, it's 88 or 90 degrees, and on my cool side, it's 78 to 80 degrees. If you're in an area where you're struggling to maintain temperature, sometimes you'll need multiple reflectors and multiple bulbs to do that. If you're someone who likes to watch your tortoise's activity at night or what they're doing, there are red bulbs such as this or black lights that can be used as well in spectra that the tortoises don't see but allow us just to see what they're doing. I also mentioned the importance of UVB light. It's been shown in all the tortoise species that have been looked at that UVB light is essential to these animals as well. They use that to synthesize vitamin D, and vitamin D is a hormone that's important for a whole host of different functions in our bodies. I like to make sure that I have a reflector with one of my coil bulbs in the enclosure so I'm getting these animals that exposure. In the case of this lighting, as well as our heat lighting, I typically recommend about 12 hours of lighting, but I really only recommend about two hours of UVB lighting now, one hour in the morning and one hour in the evening. If you do notice that you have tortoises and they seem to be a little photophobic, meaning that they blink a lot, it may be that they're getting too much UVB light and you can decrease that. In addition to making sure that the temperature is set, it's important that we get the humidity to where we want it as well. Simply spraying an enclosure or making sure that the, the orchid bark or a live plant is sprayed will be sufficient to get that humidity up and using that hygrometer along with your thermometer will help you determine that. For most species of tortoise, 50 to 60% humidity is plenty. In some of the more tropical species, you can go up 60 to 70%. Next, I'd like to talk about diets. Most tortoises are herbivorous, meaning that they really need plant material. There are, however, some species that are omnivores, and those that are typically get some of that animal material through eating invertebrates, such as earthworms or crickets. For the majority that are herbivores, we like to recommend a diet that is comprised primarily of vegetables, fresh vegetables, and haze. If we can get our tortoises to eat haze, such as timothy hay or orchard grasses, that's really ideal because they're very low calories and they provide a nice substrate for them to digest to get these essential volatile fatty acids. The problem is a lot of our tortoises in captivity get spoiled and they're a lot like us and they want foods that have a little bit more flavor. In those cases, we often look at things like romaine lettuce, mustard greens, and collard greens. Those are the primary thing I use in addition to those haze. And when I mention haze, I try to stay away from alfalfa haze because they're a little bit too rich in protein and too rich in calcium. The next level of vegetables that I like to include, a lot of the mixed vegetables, beans, squash, peppers, anything with color, the tortoises really tend to like. And then ultimately I try to limit the diet to about 10% fruits. Most tortoises love things like berries and apples, and the more colorful they are, the more that they'll want to go after them. But they're really good in moisture and vitamins, but they just don't quite have that 
pack as far as their nutritional value. So keeping them at a lesser concentration ensures that we're not over diluting the diet. The more diverse you can make their diet, the better off they're going to be. However, in some cases we struggle to find really quality vegetables and so I'll often recommend commercial diets in those situations and there are a number of commercial diets available that are both a pelleted form as well as a semi-moist form. With these types of diets, the big benefit is that we can get additional nutrition that might not be in the vegetables that we can pick up at the market. By offering these types of diets, which we Flukers offers in the case of juvenile or adult pellets, or in the uh, semi-moist pellets, we're actually getting that additional nutrition to them. We can mix these right in with the greens, and no different than our own diet, the more diverse, the better off we'll be. There are supplements such as calcium powders that can be sprinkled on top of the diet. These also can help with improving the nutrition of that animal. Next, I'd like to talk about behavior of these animals and handling them. Tortoises, unlike a lot of our other reptiles, don't tend to be one of the more scarier species. Most of these animals are not going to bite and they can't really get away too quickly. What we're really after when we're handling them is to support their body, and make sure that they feel comfortable. In the case of the sulcata tortoise that we're going to add into our enclosure, simply grasping the shell on both sides, the carapace being the top and the plastron, with my index finger and thumb, I can support this tortoise and you can see how relaxed he is. In many cases, on a smaller animal, just placing them in the palm of your hand will work as well. We can pick these guys up and put them right into their enclosure. And like any reptile, it's important to give them a couple hours just to roam around their enclosure and get used to what's happening in there. Identify those shelters, find out where their food and water sources are, and then we can come back and work with them at that point. If at any time you notice any clinical disease associated with your tortoises, including the fact that they seem to be hiding a lot in their shelter and not actively looking for food or eating or drinking, that you notice they seem lighter when you hold them, or they have swollen joints, a discharge from their eyes, nose or mouth, or a skin discoloration or a diarrhea, it's important to contact your veterinarian who is used to working with these animals so that they can help you. If you're looking for more information about tortoises, you can download the tortoise setup and care sheet or order any of these products we featured in this video by visiting flukerfarms.com.